Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming um, early on a Sunday morning. I appreciate everybody turning out. Um, today, we're going to have a fresh look at renewables in the home, looking at solar and heat pumps. I'll do about a 15-minute presentation and then um, about five minutes for questions. So if anybody's got questions, just let me know um, and we can go through them at the end. So just very briefly, who are Green Building Renewables? So we are uh, predominantly domestic installers and we do five main technologies, air source, ground source, solar PV, solar batteries and EV chargers. And we at present have um, seven offices across the UK and we're looking to expand that. The closest offices to here we have is uh, we have one in York and we have one in Doncaster. But as you can see on the map there, we, we already cover um, large parts of the country and we're looking to expand that over the next couple of years so that we can have full coverage across the UK. So why choose renewables now? Um, somewhat of a silly question. I think everybody's more than aware of the issues we have with rising energy prices and energy security. Um, this graph, I think everybody's fully aware of the increases in electricity prices, but I think this really puts it into perspective when you look at, for many years, the price of electricity was fairly consistent, going up maybe one, two pence a year, and then we've seen a rapid increase over the last couple of years. Um, the government obviously put a cap in place, um, which was originally due to run for two years, and then that quickly got changed to six months. So we know that um, up until the end of April, the maximum amount that anybody can pay for um, per kilowatt uh, hour of electric is 34 pence. Um, after that, I don't think anybody really knows where it could go. There was talk of before the government intervened that it was going to go up to 78 pence um, next summer. And they've done, uh, the Cornwall Insight Research Group have done a bit of um, analysis and they believe that the um, average energy bill could rise from this uh, £2,500 cap to over £4,000 um, next year. So obviously we're all aware of the pressures that everybody faces. So how do we combat that I think is, is the important question. And we have two choices really. We either create our own electricity um, with a solar and battery storage system or we look at installing an efficient heating system or I would always say the best answer is to do both. So we've installed a, a range of systems for, for many people over the years um, and customers there who've had solar PV been, as, as most Yorkshire people are, very honest and very um, uh, an honest assessment of um, the financial benefits of solar PV. The rising energy costs have meant that the payback period for a PV system has fallen dramatically. So although with inflation in materials and labour costs, the price of a solar panel system um, has steadily increased from around about £10,200 um, in 2019 to around about £11,500 now, the fact that the energy prices have gone up so rapidly has meant that the payback period has dropped from over 13 years to at the moment it's about eight years and if the energy prices continue to go up, the payback period will be less than six years. Um, that's based on the 50 pence, but obviously every time that we um, suffer an increase in energy costs, the payback period decreases as well. So a brief sort of overview of how a solar PV system works. To be honest, a PV system is, is a really simple install, whether it be for a new build or whether it be for a renovation, or whether it be for a retrofit. Solar PV is pretty much applicable to, to every property. So as you can see there, we have the solar panels on the roof, which generate DC. That then goes into an inverter, which is usually sited in the loft, but can also be put in a garage or in a utility room or anything like that. Um, and from there, what happens is the energy is then sent to the consumer unit in the house. And then after that, it is then distributed wherever it needs to go. So whether that be washing machines, kettles, cookers, whatever that is. The, the additional element that has really come on in the last few years is battery storage. So now you can add uh, a battery onto the system and what that does is that allows us to um, store as much of the electricity as we possibly can. The additional benefit that 
a lot of people, especially with electric vehicles, have found as well is certain suppliers are offering a reduced rate tariff at night. So, for example, I'm on the Octopus Go tariff and between half past nine at night and half past one in the morning, I get seven and a half pence tariff. So what I can do on, on uh, a miserable overcast day is I can import a seven and a half pence, store, my, store it in my batteries and then use it the next day. So regardless of any solar gain, I know that I'm reducing my bills by 60-70% even without the solar. So the benefits really um, is of, of solar on a south facing roof is you pretty much, if you've got a south facing roof, you will get the benefit of the solar all day. Um, but that if you don't have a south facing roof, people always say, well, well, can I still get it? And the answer is yes. I have an east-west split and what I have is some panels on the front of my house and some panels on the, on the rear. And what can happen then is you get it obviously on one elevation in the morning and the, the other elevation in the afternoon. So as long as you've got um, a south, a west or an east facing roof, panels are pretty much applicable. Even if you don't, we can look at other options like ground mounting, so you could put them on uh, console tub, tubs or airframes. So I mentioned earlier the benefits of, of having a battery. Um, and as I say there, we, we are looking to uh, use as much of that solar generation as possible. The rates that you get for exporting back to the grid are negligible. It's six, seven pence. If you're importing at 35, 50 pence, it makes more sense for, for you to store as much as that as you possibly can and save importing that uh, later. So brief recap on solar. Um, obviously, it's designed to lower your energy bills and make significant savings. Um, it makes you less vulnerable to rising energy costs, so the more independent you can become, the better. And obviously as well, the, the benefit is we're lowering our carbon footprint. If we're generating our own free electric and we're not having to rely on the grid to import it. If anybody's interested, we have a uh, solar panel calculator on our website, so you can go on there and you can put your postcode in, you can select your orientation, the number of panels you want, and it will give you um, an estimated cost for that system, but it will also give you a estimated savings and you can, you can change the amount that you pay for electric and then it will obviously um, calculate that for you. So that was um, solar PV. So when we look at the second um, system, looking at a, an air source heat pump. So <clears throat> when, we, when we're looking at measuring efficiency in heating systems, we talk about something called a COP, a coefficient of performance. Um, typical uh, gas boilers are between 70 and 90% efficient. So all the boilers obviously are less efficient. If you get a new air rated boiler, you're probably going to be in the 90% efficiency. What that means is um, for every one kilowatt of electric that you put in, you're going to get between 0.7 and 0.9 kilowatts of heat out of there. Um, a question then to keep everybody engaged, how efficient do you think that an air source heat pump is? So for every one kilowatt of electric that we put in, how many kilowatts of heat do you think we get out? Anybody want to put the hand up and answer? Gentleman at the back? Any, any other answers? Any advance on four? Three point four. The gentleman at the back was very close. That, <clears throat> that obviously is, a, is an average and will change depending on the type of heat, the manufacturer of heat pump and depending on um, the flow temperature. But typically, we're at about 3.4. So for every kilowatt of electric we put in, we hope to get about 3.4 kilowatts of heat out. Um, you can already see the benefits of if you are generating your own electricity for free, and you're, getting, you're putting one kilowatt of free electric that you've generated from your solar in there and you can convert that to 3.4, then that's a real big benefit. Um, so yeah, like I said there, if, if you've got an air source heat pump, then it, it converts it even further. So air source heat pumps, just a few facts about those. You have a compressor that sits outside. Most people have seen these or something like these with an aircon unit, it's very similar in terms of size. Um, and its dimensions. Um, then you have a hot water cylinder that sits inside just as you do if you have a um, traditional system boiler. Um, 
what it does is it, it turns a lot of low grade heat into usable heat basically by compressing it. So I've been doing this now for 12 years and still the most straightforward example uh, or comparison that I can give is it's a fridge in reverse. So what you're doing is you're taking a lot of that low grade heat, it draws it through the back, compresses it and turns it into usable heat. The gas that we use in the systems, uh, the R32, will work right down to minus 20. Because um, people obviously say, well, that's fine, but what if it's minus five outside? The heat pump will work, but obviously the lower the outside air temperature, the harder the heat pump has to work. So that efficiency that we talked about there of 3.4 will drop um, when it's colder. But, and obviously when the temperature rises, it'll become more efficient, but that, that's an average of 3.4. Um, it, it obviously is a, a cost effective way of replacing electric oil LPG systems. If you're on gas, I know gas has gone up, but it is still relatively cheap. If you're building a new, a new house, um, I would always recommend looking at a heat pump. If you've got a boiler that's three or four years old, a gas boiler, I would say I'd wait till that comes to the end of its life because the savings that you would make wouldn't be huge. But if you're building a new property or you're on oil or LPG, then absolutely it's, it's the way forward. Um, it does lend itself um, really well to new build properties. So those properties that are well insulated um, and have underfloor heating means that the heat pump can run very efficiently um, on, that, on that system. A, heat, a traditional fossil fuel system will run at around uh, 70, 75 degrees, whereas a heat pump runs at around 45 degrees. So when you're running underfloor, an underfloor system will typically run at that temperature, which means the heat pump is very efficient and you don't have to blend uh, the, the system down. When you're blending it down from 75 degrees, it's not as efficient as, as running it with a heat pump at 45. So once again, a kind of a, just an example, a schematic there of how a heat pump works. As we said, the uh, compressor unit sits outside. Um, it then comes in and it will either be diverted to the hot water cylinder to provide hot water, or it will be diverted to either radiators or underfloor. A lot of people ask, do I have to have underfloor? The answer is no. You can have an all radiator system if you like, or you can have a mixture in most properties you would have underfloor downstairs and then radiators upstairs. So that's uh, absolutely fine. Um, the other thing about the uh, cylinder is that it's all uh, pressurized. It's not the old sort of gravity fed. So it can be located anywhere. Most people, if you're building a new house, will put it in a plant room. But if you push the space, it can go in a garage or a loft or something like that. It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't need a header tank like um, uh, most of the older systems need. So Mr. Floyd there standing proudly with his heat pump. Um, why did he choose an air source heat pump? Well, he was, um, he was on LPG, so it lowered his running costs, reducing his bills. You actually gain the space back where you used to have a boiler inside. So people say, well, it takes up space outside. It does, but you no longer have a boiler inside. So people can often reclaim that space where the, the boiler once stood. Um, the, probably the, the biggest concern a lot of people have is not about the heating, it's about the hot water. People always say, will it give me enough hot water? Absolutely it will. It can provide up to 60 degrees for hot water, which is more than enough. Normally most people set their cylinder to be uh, 50 degrees. As we said earlier, it distributes heat at 45 for underfloor heating and radiators. If you are going to have radiators, you would need to look at the sizing of them. People often say, I need huge, great big radiators. It's not the case. They do need to be bigger than if you were on a fossil fuel system because it's running at a lower floor temperature. However, they don't need to be massive. And there are government grants available um, for an air source heat pump. So the government now offers something called the BUS scheme, the Boiler Upgrade Scheme, where you can get up to £5,000 up front for an air source heat pump. So there's Mr Floyd giving us a little um, overview. He's very happy with his system. Um, enough hot water and enough heating. Um, so how much does it cost? Um, typical installation cost, once again it varies on the type of installation and it varies given the size of the heat pump um, but you're typically looking at between nine and twelve thousand pounds for an installation in a new build property 
and then obviously you've got five thousand pounds that can come off that so hopefully that that brings it's never going to be as uh, cheap as a boiler but the the grant will hopefully bring it down into somewhere in that region and that's it from me if there's any uh, any questions i'd be happy to take them do we one down here do we need a mic thank you Yep, so the, the BUS scheme is pretty much open to anybody. You've got to have, if it's a, a retrofit on an existing property, you've got to have certain uh, insulation measures done, similar to the old renewable heat incentive in terms of they don't want to give you a £5,000 grant for a heat pump if you've not insulated your loft or your cavity or something like that. So as long as you meet those criteria, um, it's pretty much open to everybody. So if we have a stone to build, perhaps our walls are already in the Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if you if you as long as you don't have an unfilled cavity, because obviously yeah, there are certain properties that have solid or they have um, random stone. You can get exemptions, but obviously you have to explain why. So quite rightly, the government has said we don't want to be giving five thousand pounds to somebody if um, they've not insulated the the cavity or the loft. But as long as your loft's done and cavity where applicable, it's pretty much open to everybody. Anybody else? There's a gentleman here, a couple, two down here. Yep. 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 So the, the probably the system you're talking about there's two there's M phase or solar edge, um, which basically normally you have one inverter that goes onto um, and it two strings goes onto the panels. You can still get them where uh, every panel has its own optimizer or inverter. I would always say, being totally honest, unless you've got issues with shading or multiple elevations, it's not that cost effective in order to, to do that. Some people like it, some people do it, but to have now the, the inverters that we use nowadays have two strings. So you, if you have one sort of um, set of panels that might be in shade, you can put that on a separate string so that it doesn't impact on the other panels. But the system that you're talking about is still available and we do still do it in, on rare occasions, yeah. No. Well, obviously that was, that was brought in quite rightly to stimulate the market when the cost of a, a standard four kilowatt system by itself was 12, 15 grand. Yeah, but obviously as the years have gone, as you see from that graph, the cost of electric now and the price has come down from where it was many years ago means that you don't actually need the subsidy in order to make it economically viable. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the good thing from from my perspective and and from your perspective on renewables, they actually reduced. So the 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 VAT rate has always been five percent for the last ten years. They reduced it from the standard twenty um, percent. In April, they actually scrapped VAT on renewables. So if you were putting a heat pump in now, or you're putting solar panels in now. You would get it at zero percent VAT. That seems still safe for insulation, like Don't know about insulation, I'm afraid. Time's up now. Lovely. Okay, my time's up, guys. If anybody wants to chat further, we're at stand C29, uh, C290. Um, you can come and see us there. I'd be happy to, to chat in detail. All right, thank you very much.